I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, it's hot and muggy. Many schools were uh, cut short today. And San Diego Gas and Electric calls on consumers to conserve power. We'll look at the impact the heat is having on the region. And with October approaching, San Diego's fire-prone weather is worrisome at best. When will we get rain, and when will that rain break the drought? I'm Peggy Pico with that update. And then on the anniversary of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy and the resulting housing collapse, we find out how Bank of America's payout may help San Diego consumers. And the new state law trying to make the road safer for cyclists. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. With temperatures topping 100 in some parts of San Diego, many schools cut classes short. KPBS education reporter Matt Bowler says it's because some schools don't have air conditioning, and San Diego Unified says schools will have a second day out early tomorrow. Parents brave the heat and humidity to pick up their kids early from school here at Alice Barney Elementary in University Heights. San Diego Unified gave students from 120 elementary, middle, and high schools time off because of the heat. Eight-year-old Isaac Alvarez says the heat doesn't just affect him in the classroom, but one of his favorite things at school suffers, too. At recess, a lot of kids just don't play. Parent Valerie Loy says none of the classrooms at Barney have air conditioning, and students normally tough it out. No, actually the rooms are pretty hot on a normal day, so I am this heat, I can imagine, you know, how hot it would be. For many parents, scheduling work and last-minute changes to child care can be a challenge. Josette Alvarez was picking up her second-grade daughter and third-grade son, and she says that parents were upset about having to pick up their kids early and rearrange work schedules. It is inconvenient. I have heard parents complain, but it is what it is. I'd rather my kids be comfortable and cool. The hot weather continues into Tuesday. Matt Bowler, KPBS News. Well, some schools are planning another minimum day, and some aren't. Contact your school if you have any questions. California's heat wave is also prompting utility officials to encourage us to conserve power. San Diego Gas and Electric has instituted a Reduce Your Use Refund program. Joining us to talk about the situation, KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. So, Eric, what are they specifically asking customers to do? Well, Dwayne, the power company is hoping that people really don't go overboard trying to keep cool. They're asking residents to reduce the strain on the power grid between 11 and 6 today, and they're asking for similar help during the same period of time tomorrow. Power forecasters say the peak power usage could climb into record-breaking territory either today or tomorrow, and rolling back electricity use could put money back into the pockets of customers, at least the ones that signed up with SDG&E's Reduce Your Use program. They could earn a bill credit of 75 cents for each kilowatt hour they save. There is a scale on the utility's website. Use less than the amount of power shown, and that refund will be added to your bill. Now, is there a shortage of power at this point? SDG and officials, SDG and e officials say no, plenty of power. They say that rolling back usage just helps them stabilize the local grid. And Eric, if there's enough capacity, why is SDG and e pushing to build more power plants? Well, that's exactly the question that some critics are asking. SDG and e says that they are asking for proposals that would generate 500 to 800 megawatts of locally produced power. That's to replace power, they say, that used to be generated by the San Onofre Nuclear Power Station. But Engineer Bill Powers says that doesn't make any sense. San Onofre initially goes down in January of 2012. In the first six months of 2012, within 80 miles of San Onofre, 2,000 megawatts of natural gas-fired plants came online. Since that time, even more have come online. At the same time, in the same period, 3,000-plus megawatts of renewable energy came online. Powers says that SDG and E has steadily projected the need for more power, but he says demand has stayed relatively flat. Earlier this year, the power company predicted a possible peak power usage of 5,300 megawatts locally. Power usage peaked near that 4,800 megawatt mark in the midst of the current heat wave. And that's one reason why he's working with a group trying to stop the Pio Pico power plant that's been proposed for Otay Mesa. He says the region just doesn't need that extra power. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson. 
Of course, San Diegans are used to Santa Ana heat in September, but what difference, if any, does this high humidity and hurricane along the Baja coast make? Peggy Pico finds out more about our wildfire risk and when we might expect some rain. Joining me with a detailed look at our weather patterns are my guest, meteorologist Alex Tardy with the National Weather Service, and Dan Kayan, climate researcher with Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the U.S. Geological Survey. Welcome back. Thanks for having us. Now, Alex, temperatures along the coast are going to be about 10 to 15 degrees above normal, with I believe expected temps in the 80s and 90s this mm. week. Why the high temperatures along our coast? Yeah, it seems like a broken record. We just went through this recently, and it's been a warm summer. Um, what's happening is the marine layer, which cools us off all the time, is really squashed and really not even there anymore. So we're feeling more like we're in the deserts as this warm air continues to build. So typically we have that marine layer that affects us during the day and the night. Right now it's really, it's not on, it's off. So our natural air conditioning is off, but that doesn't exactly explain the uh, humidity. Where's that moisture coming from? The humidity is partly coming from our sea surface temperatures, our ocean temperatures. If you've been out in the water, they've been warm for a while, which is nice, but that keeps our minimum temperatures elevated at night and elevates the humidity. It raises the moisture content and we really start to feel that in the mugginess. And is that hurricane moisture then? It's not directly hurricane moisture. Uh, we had Norbert last week and we have Odal this week and it's, it's kind of indirect. These warm sea surface temperatures have been in place for a while so it's indirect. The, the part about the hurricanes is we start seeing increased thunderstorm activity out in our mountains and deserts and that's more attributed to the tropical moisture. And speaking of moisture, Dan, uh, basically we're hearing conflicting reports about this El Nino or supposed El Nino that is, uh, might be seen, we might see this year. Can you tell us about what we can expect? Well, um, conditions are a little uh, warmer than normal in the tropical Pacific, unlike the extra tropics that a uh, Alex was talking about, our nearshore waters being exceptionally warm. Um, for an El Nino to develop, we need uh, temperatures in the surface areas of the eastern part of the Pacific Basin to be much warmer than they are right now. And chances are something in the neighborhood of uh, two to one that we'll see at least a mild El Nino, but it doesn't look like we'll have a strong El Nino, unfortunately. Yeah. When you say mild El Nino, what does that mean in terms of inches of rain? Well, if, if I knew, um, <laughs> right. I would have a higher pay grade. But uh, the um, it turns out that mild El Ninos can, can gives us, give us lots of flavors of rainfall here in, in California. Uh, the good thing is that we don't have cool conditions along the tropical Pacific, which is uh, almost a sure symptom that things are going to be normal to below. Uh, having at least mildly warmer temperatures, we could get anything from not so good to a pretty good rainfall right. season. So, so, so the, we'll the see. The jury's still out on that one. And it Alex, is. I know as we approach October, people of course naturally start worrying about wildfires, yeah. the hot, you know, hot dry by this time of the year. What's the forecast telling us as far as um, Santa Ana winds and our fire danger? Yeah, well right now the fire danger, because of this three year drought, because of the warm temperatures, we are record warm temperatures in California since January 1st, record warmth. But we're going into a situation where it's above normal threat because of the dry fuel. The vegetation that's around us is very stressed. The soil has very little moisture. So if we knew the amount of Santa Ana's, you know, we'd, it'd be helpful, but we do know we'll get Santa Ana's. It's just a matter of when. October and November, they're very common. They actually peak out in January. But by January, you're supposed to be wet. Mm -hmm. So we'll be holding our breath this October, November, because if we don't get significant rainfall that's widespread to really put it uh, uh, to damper the situation with the fire weather, we know we're going to get some Santa Ana's and it's going to be critical if there are any starts. And this dry brush down, of course, the drought, everybody knows about the drought here. It seems to be one of the worst, but how does yeah. it compare to other droughts in California? It, it is one of the worst. It's uh, not the worst uh, when we look at, at the data stacked up, but it's certainly uh, extreme and we've lost over the last three years equivalent of almost a year's worth of precipitation. So we, we have a big hole to climb out of. And uh, what will it take to get uh, get us out of this? How much rain? Oh, it's going to be 
statewide, probably 150% of normal. So not twice as much of normal, but statewide. If it just rains in Southern California, it's not going to help the drought necessarily at all. We need the whole state to have almost twice as much precipitation they normally see. That in itself brings problems, right? Because that could bring some flooding if that were to happen. Um, it may take us a, a few years before we stop talking about drought. Okay, yeah. and that was my last question <laughs> to Dan here. How long, how long do you think we can, uh, it'll take to climb out of this uh, drought? Well, I, I suspect that uh, even after this year, um, even if it's a mildly good winter, we will probably still have some uh, lasting effects of this deficit because it's been uh, quite extreme and there's there's been our reservoirs, soil moisture, deep water, aquifers and so forth are really depleted right now. All right, so nothing nothing too soon it looks like. Uh, Dan Kahn and Alex Tardy, thank you so much. Thank you. California's dry weather is leading to an increased number of wildfires. Cal Fire says it's already responded to more than 4,800 fires since January. That's about 1,000 more than an average year. Currently, two wildfires have led to hundreds of evacuations. One near Yosemite National Park has burned two dozen structures. Farther north, outside of Sacramento, nearly 4,000 acres have burned. A community group backing San Diego's minimum wage increase says opponents are violating state law. They say signature gatherers are lying to get voters to put the issue on the ballot. Raise Up San Diego is calling on the state attorney general and district attorney to open an investigation. Opponents of raising the minimum wage have until Wednesday to submit nearly 34,000 signatures to force the issue on the ballot. Nurses at Tri-City Medical Center in Oceanside say emergency room conditions are endangering patients' lives. They say the ER is too often overcrowded and inadequately staffed. Management says they're not commenting until they investigate. Tri-City is a public health care district in North County that treats more than 90,000 patients a year. The issue comes as candidates vie for a position on the district's board in November. San Diego County is the number one destination for veterans who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan. The biggest challenge in our region, says the new Secretary of Veterans Affairs during his visit to San Diego, is building up enough capacity and personnel to properly serve them. We have a lot to learn from what you're doing here to take care of those veterans. About six weeks into his new job as Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Bob McDonald made a stop in San Diego to visit the VA Medical Center in La Jolla. I've been really so excited to come here because in many ways San Diego, the community is on the cutting edge of working together to create one Department of Veterans Affairs. McDonald says he came to San Diego to learn more about treatment programs like the Aspire Center in Old Town helping troubled vets transition back into society. Some say they're waiting too long for care. That's uh, not the case as much here in San Diego as it is in other parts around the country. Although we have to be uh, forward looking, recognizing that many of our veterans who are leaving the military service are settling in San Diego and we have to build our capacity ahead of that curve. San Diego's VA Medical Center is adding more than 200,000 square feet of space to deal with appointment delays and troops suffering from post-traumatic stress. Across the nation, we've got significant problems with access, with transparency, with accountability, and um, our issues with integrity are well documented. But I'm convinced the framework for changing VA is in place. To improve communications with veterans, town hall meetings are being conducted nationwide to get feedback. The first was just held in Oceanside to identify areas of concern. The next town halls will be held Thursday at the San Diego VA Medical Center and next Monday at the Imperial Valley Veterans Memorial Hall. The Navy identified the pilot who went missing after last week's fighter jet crash as 26-year-old Lieutenant Nathan Poleski. The uh, crash happened shortly after takeoff uh, from the USS Carl Vinson when two F-A-18C Hornet jets collided midair over the western Pacific. Pulaski is presumed dead. The other pilot ejected safely and was rescued. Check out the uh, Navy's newest assault ship. It arrived at its home port right here in San Diego today. The soon-to-be-commissioned USS America is more than five football fields long and the first of its kind. It's been touring South America on its way to California. A commissioning ceremony is scheduled for next month.
It's been six years to the day since investment firm Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, which led to the stock market plummeting, Great Recession, and the housing market collapse. Peggy Pico has an update on how San Diego is rebounding. Bank of America agreed to pay more than $16 billion to settle a federal lawsuit stemming from the housing crisis. Joining me with how the payout could impact consumers and where the local real estate market stands now are my guest, Marnie Cox, chief economist at Sandag, and Michael Lee, finance lecturer at the Corky McMillan Center for Real Estate at San Diego Univers State University. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Michael, this $16 billion settlement, a big chunk of that money is supposed to go to uh, consumers for relief. Do we know how much of that money is supposed to come to consumers and basically how it's going to help them? I think about two thirds of that is earmarked for consumer relief. And most of that is to modify mortgages for homeowners that might still be struggling uh, to make payments. Do you think any of that money will go to people who have already foreclosed? Uh, a small amount. I think they're more token payments, and I don't know exactly how that's going to be allocated, but it's a small portion. In uh, Marnie, San Diego County, like the rest of the nation, certainly had record numbers of uh, foreclosures and, and homeowners struggling to keep their house, which in turn, of course, must have impacted our local economy. How has the uh, local economy been doing lately? Has it actually fully recovered? No, I wouldn't say we've fully recovered. We're better off than where we were at the depths of the recession, but no, we haven't fully recovered. Good examples, that's the construction industry, peaked at about 96,000 jobs and fell to about mm, 52,000. We're back up about another 10,000 or so, so we've added about 10,000 additional jobs. We're a long ways from where we were. Do you think San Diego suffered worse than, uh, let's say, the rest of the nation? Yeah, a good example is that of, say, what proportion of the jobs did you lose? Uh, we lost more in proportion of our jobs here locally than we did at the national level. Well, I know, Michael, that certain neighborhoods did better or worse when it came to foreclosures or, or homeowners struggling. Um, the neighborhoods that were most affected, how are they doing now as far as in real estate? Well, they've come back significantly, but uh, if you bought a house in parts of our south or east counties back in 2006 or 2007, you're most likely uh, still uh, significantly below where you purchased that price. And that's translated into a number of uh, people in those areas still have underwater uh, situations where the mortgages are more than the uh, price of the house. So are, the, uh, are housing sales up or down or prices up or down? Prices have been on a, a fairly significant uh, upward roll for about a year and a half, though it's been slowing uh, significantly this year. Uh, sales are still uh, relatively weak. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that underwater people are less likely to uh, be selling their house, as well as the fact that prices being as high as they are, uh, a lot of buyers buyers are, are just income constrained to get into the market. And, and Marnie, do you think major settlements like Bank of America's 16 billion, and there's been a few others, do you think it's enough to discourage financial institutions from defrauding customers or sort of doing these fuzzy loans? No, I don't believe so. Um, the actual penalty itself is clearly not large enough, but I think that there are incentives built into the system that will probably will not prevent another one from occurring. Plus, some of the new regulations that have been put in place are probably not sufficient to forego this potential crisis from occurring again. When you say an incentive, can you give us an example? Yeah, there, I think that um, one way to look at it is people are paid based upon the volume of mortgages that they bring in. And so you always have that kind of an incentive built into the process. And when the market starts to turn down, the incentive on you as a salesperson is immense. So you go out and try to get that marginal buyer, right, who may partly be qualified, and you try to figure out ways to make them qualified. That's the process that's still built in. Do you think that with today's standards in place that San Diego could see another uh, housing bubble and then burst again? Well, we'd have to see home prices go up farther than they have today. But the answer in general is yes. And it comes from two perspectives. One, the constraint on the market from building new units is still in place today. And even with a slow amount of growth, eventually that's going to turn into a relative bubble. Prices are going to rise again, even just within the local market, let alone the national one. Michael, do you agree with that? How long do you think before we could see another, you know, this spike and then drop again for housing? Well, I think, as uh, I said earlier, the prices have been slowing in the, the rate of increase. And 
it's still a, a relatively unaffordable market. And as a consequence, I think it's a natural uh, process where you're not going to have a real bubble unless your lending standards are significantly loosened. And there's some sense that it's beginning to happen on the margins, but not a volume basis. And so until that happens, I'd say no. All right. There's a whole lot more about this on our website, kpbs.org. Michael Lee and Marnie Cox, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie. The Department of Motor Vehicles may be sending you a refund in the mail for an overcharge on vehicle registration. The California Board of Equalization says DMV is using driver's zip codes instead of their actual address to come up with the fees. As a result, the Board of Equalization believes thousands of Californians have been overcharged. They say the problem involves California taxpayers living in what's called a split zip code. We've even had instances where the people have used a map to show where they lived and unfortunately, the Department of Motor Vehicles has just said, well, you'll have to pay the higher rate and then you'll have to apply for a refund. And again, we just think that that's wrong. We think people should be charged the proper amount of tax. Nobody in California should be overtaxed. Officials say car buyers are being overcharged on their sales tax while registering their vehicles. The Board of Equalization says DMV refuses to use the board's lookup tool where it identifies rates by address. If you think you may be owed a refund, you can fill out a form at your local DMV. More than 100 cyclists are killed each year in collisions with cars in California. Now, a new law is designed to make the road safer for those who pedal. KPBS reporter Jill Replogle has the story. Under the new California law, vehicles must stay three feet away from cyclists when passing them on the street. Previously, the law just said vehicles had to pass at a, quote, safe distance. Breaking the law carries a $35 fine. If a collision results from breaking the law and a cyclist is injured, the driver of the vehicle can be fined $220. On College Avenue outside of San Diego State, students bike through heavy traffic on the four-lane road with no bike lane. Here we caught up with Jared Herholtz. He just moved here from Pennsylvania. He says he didn't know about the new law, but he thinks it's a good idea. Everything I do revolves around the bike, essentially. You know, I think it's a great way to live. And I think prom promoting laws like that are going to encourage more bikers because it can be kind of scary to be on the road. At a gas station down the road, Carl Bradley was filling up the tank of his pickup truck. He says he didn't know about the new law either. It sounds like it's a good concept for safety, but it also sounds like uh, it might be somewhat difficult to execute in certain situations. Um, you know, I don't know that there's always enough room for between the vehicle and the curb to allow three feet for a bicycle. The law does include an exception to the three foot rule if traffic or roadway conditions make it impossible for motorists to comply. In that case, they're supposed to slow down and only pass the cyclist when it's safe. California joins 23 other states that require vehicles to stay three feet away from cyclists while passing. Jill Rep Local, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next News Hour, we hear from voters in Scotland before a crucial vote for independence. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Have you heard this? There's a new generation of robots. Tom Ritchie of the Associated Press introduces us to one very sophisticated social robot. Meet Isaac. This is Butler. Talk to Jibo. First family robot. Each is a social robot designed to interact with humans. Social robots really interact with people in a way that feels much more like you're interacting with a someone rather than a something. And sophisticated robots like Isaac, being developed at the Naval Research Laboratory, can assess the world around them. The field is actually called cognitive robotics, where we model certain processes that humans have that uh, gives uh, give us cognitive abilities. Isaac has an uncanny sense of situational awareness. He's partially humanoid, with cameras for eyes, a range sensor, and scores of motors to mimic human movement. So what's important is that it has a lot of features that help support research in how humans are going to work with robots. The makers of Butler say it's designed to perform a specific function, deliver small items to hotel guests. 
We call it a service robot, but it's social in the sense that it's designed to be in human spaces and interact with people and around people. So it interacts with the front desk agent when they're sending it somewhere. It interacts with people on the elevator as it's going along, and it interacts with people at the door when the delivery arrives. Aloft Hotels is currently testing Butler at a hotel in Cupertino, California. Jibo, on the other hand, is stationary, but is being promoted as a family's personal helper by telling stories to children, posting reminders, even taking pictures of family events. It's not a technology that is ever trying to replace or compete with our human relationships or even our relationships with companion animals and other sorts of things we, we enjoy. Jibo is expected to be available next year. But even as social robots explode on the scene, researchers acknowledge there are limitations to what they can do and it's important to manage human expectations. Perception is really one of the hard areas in, uh, in robotics and to be social in the world you, you have to be able to interpret the scene around you. Now researchers are working on a sense of touch for Isaac and others like him, thus giving social robots a growing spectrum of activities with which to interact with people. Tom Ritchie, Associated Press. The hot sticky weather expected to persist through most of the week, mostly in the upper 80s along the coast over the next couple of days, slightly cooler by Thursday, up to 100 for the inland valley tomorrow, then back into the 90s. Chance of showers in the mountain and desert areas Wednesday. Desert highs will reach 103 tomorrow, then slightly cooler the rest of the week. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.